Um, my name is Thomas Pedazzoni, and today I'd like to present a few informations about uh, the Buildwood build system and its usage for real projects. Basically, the idea that led me to propose that talk to um, the Embedded Linux conference is that I'm, I'm using Buildwood um, almost on a daily basis to build various uh, Embedded Linux uh, systems for various devices. And even so, uh, the tool is pretty easy to use. Um, I, I thought it, it would be useful to share some kind of base practices and how I use it to build the systems that I run on, on uh, various devices. So briefly, I work for Free Electrons, which is um, a services company in the embedded Linux business doing development and training. Uh, one of the things worth mentioning is that all of our, our training materials are uh, freely available in our Creative Commons license, so you can all download them and see what they are. Um, I'm also a contributor to Build Roots, obviously, and I come from the southwest of France, but I guess everyone has already guessed where I come from, uh, thanks to my terrible accent. Okay, so today we're gonna see a couple of uh, things about real root. So for what it is and how it works, and a few examples of systems I've generated with uh, real root. The idea of that first section is just to give enough background uh, so that everybody can um, get some useful information from the second part, where I will uh, present the, some of the best practices. Uh, the idea is that people who have never used real root or just um, use it a little bit. Uh, can understand uh, the rest of the presentation. So I will then give best practices on, on different aspects on the system configuration and build root usage. Uh, finally, present a few features that will be part of the next uh, build root release, which should appear in next month, and give some conclusion and hopefully have some time for questions at the end. So what is build root? It's an embedded Linux build system. So its goal is to automate the process of generating a cross-compiling tool chain, of generating a root file system with many libraries and applications, um, and automating the process of compiling a kernel image and possibly multiple bootloader images. So the idea is that you define a configuration and it all does the work for you in an automated way and reproducible, or reproducible way. It can also do any combination of these. So if you're not interested by the cross-compilation tool chain, it can just generate a root file system. If you're not interested in having build root generate your kernel image, you can do it separately. So it's, it's pretty flexible in that respect. It uses a k-config configuration mechanism, so any random uh, kernel developer knows how it works. It's a very uh, familiar mechanism for describing the, the configuration. Uh, it's completely written in make, um, so a language that I guess uh, most of uh, you and most of us know uh, quite well. And it builds only what's necessary. Uh, so contrary to other build systems that have uh, the tendency of building a lot of, of things, uh, to build a base system with build roots containing just BuzzyBox, it takes less than two minutes from scratch. So you download build roots, two minutes later, you have a, a ready um, to run BuzzyBox based system. Um, it's designed with simplicity in mind. So whenever we have new features proposed in build roots, we very much try to make sure that it keeps the, the KISS principle. Uh, so there are some features that we kind of reject or don't want to integrate or try to find a, a, more, a simpler way. So we really want to, to focus on, on simplicity here. So we use standard languages, as I said, kconfig and make. Uh, the infrastructure is relatively lightweight, so in just a couple of um, hours and, or days, you can have a, a pretty good understanding of how build root works internally. It's very easy to add packages and customize the build system behavior, as I will show um, in the presentation. It is best suited for small to medium-sized embedded systems. So if you have a, a system with uh, hundreds of uh, applications and libraries to integrate, probably BuildRoot is not the right uh, tool for the job. Uh, it's really good for systems with, let's say, 10, 15, 20, 30, maybe up to 50 different libraries uh, to integrate together. Uh, and the reason is that uh, BuildRoot doesn't track which uh, source package installs what in the, in the final root file system. So as soon as you have installed something, you cannot remove it without regenerating the whole system again. And it also generates a system that doesn't have any sort of package management mechanism. So you don't have any kind of IPKG or APT thing, anything like that. It really generates a final root file system image that you flash on your device and you're done. If you want to do any sort of modification, you go back to the tool, add some more things, tune some more things, generate the new root file system image, and you can flash it on the device. So it's really good for like industrial type of applications where anyway, whenever you want to make a change to the system, you go back to the uh, design development and testing and so on. Uh, it has about well, 
seven red packages. I'm not exactly sure of the, the total count, but it, it packages things like x.org, Qt, GTK, and many um, networking related things and so on. So there's already a lot of uh, prepackaged stuff, and it's easy to add more. There are stable releases published every month, and this has been um, the case since um, almost three years now, um, something like that. And it has a pretty active user and developer community. So basic usage, make menu config. You get an interface where you can configure the architecture, the tool chain you want, the selection of packages you want for the, for the target, so all the x.org, Guazibox, and all the like. Um, the type of file system images you want, so if you want GFFS2, UBIFS, SquashFS, or whatever. The bootloader uh, images you want, the kernel image you want, and when is it, its configuration. All that thing is stored in a .config file, just like the kernel. You run make, and after some amount of time, usually pretty small, so as I said, it's two minutes for uh, the very basic system. And in the output images directory, and I will get back to the um, output directory in a, in a minute, you have the final images. So here there are multiple uh, bootloader images, one first stage bootloader, a second stage bootloader, which is U-boot, and then a kernel image, and then multiple uh, root file system file formats. And it's just ready to use and to flash on your device. So it works. So as I said, it's kconfig based for the configuration. So you have config.in files um, for each package and for the kernel and for the bootloaders and so on to describe all the various configuration options. And everything gets stored in a .config file as usual. Uh, when buildroot starts up, of course, the first thing it needs to have is a cross-compiling toolchain. So it can either generate it, uh, and in, in this case, it's limited to uh, Uselipsy. So for a long time, Buildroot has been associated to uh, the Uselipsy project, but these days it can really handle any type of uh, C library you want and practice for basically all of the projects that I do. I use either glibsy or glibsy and almost never uh, Uselipsy. So that link between uh, Buildroot and Uselipsy is, is really uh, no longer um, correct these days. And the reason is, is that um, Buildroot can also import an existing toolchain, so you have a code sorcery toolchain or whatever uh, existing toolchain, Buildroot can just make use of it. Or it can use CrossToolNG as a backend to generate uh, a toolchain, and in that case, CrossToolNG is capable of generating uselipsy, glibsy, or glibsy based toolchains. Once the toolchain is ready, then we, we can start building the root file system itself. And for that, Buildroot starts from a skeleton, so it's just a few configuration files, initialization scripts that are common to all file systems that Buildroot builds. So it takes that and puts it in the root file system. Then we have do things ready. Um, Buildroot goes through the list of selected packages. So you have uh, selected uh, BuzzyBox and Havahi and GTK. Then it goes through those uh, three packages, their dependencies and then the dependencies and so on and it fetches uh, them from the internet, configures them, builds them, installs them um, in, in the target root file system. It will also uh, do the same for the kernel image and the bootloader images if you're requested to do so. And once uh, those things are installed, it will generate the final file system images using uh, fake root uh, because build root does not run as root. It uh, does everything as a user and uses fake root to create a final file system image containing device files and with appropriate permissions for, uh, for various files. Um, because I'm going to be talking about uh, various places in the uh, source code uh, organization, here is a brief top level overview of uh, how Buildroot is uh, structured in terms of, of uh, source code organization. There is a board directory, which I will um, cover uh, in more details later, containing hardware specific and project specific files. A boot directory with all the config options and recipes for building the various bootloaders, U-boot, Bearbox, Grab, and all kind of X-loader and things like that. Uh, configs, so just like the kernel, there are some default configurations, which I will also uh, cover in more details later. Yes, we have a little bit of documentation as well, uh, especially uh, when uh, it comes to uh, writing additional package recipes. Uh, the file system directory contains the config options and make files to generate root file system images, as I was saying, and also the uh, default root file system skeleton, so that's very um, um, a limited number of, of configuration files and scripts for, that constitute the basis of the, the root file system. Some uh, config options and make files to generate the Linux kernel image, and also some real-time extensions like Xenomai or RTAI are now supported. Then a uh, bigger package directory with, with all the make files for the user space packages. 
So many libraries, many applications are in there. Um, a support directory with various MISC stuff, a bit like the script directory in the, in the kernel source code, like the kconfig code and other uh, things. Uh, target directory, which is mostly historic uh, these days, but it contains the default device table, which I will also talk a little bit um, later in the talk. And finally, the toolchain directory, where you will find the config option and make file to build uh, a toolchain or import the toolchain if, if you have made the choice of using an existing toolchain. That's basically the, the overall source code organization. And for its build process, um, uh, Buildwood puts everything in an output directory by default, but you can also do out of tree builds uh, with the standard O equal uh, syntax, just like the Linux kernel again. Um, so it's easier with uh, if you have one uh, source code base of build root to manage multiple uh, builds uh, at the same time. So in this output directory, you have a build subdirectory which contains itself one subdirectory for each component that has been built. This is basically where Buildwood extracts uh, the source code for the Linux kernel, for GK, for and so on and so on, and builds uh, those components inside those directories. It has a host directory, which contains um, like a root file system-like organization, um, in which you will find um, utilities built for the host. So when you do cost compilation, you of course uh, compile things for the target, but also need a couple of utilities that run on the host. And Buildwood tries to be as independent as possible from the distribution you have on your uh, Linux machine. So it builds a couple of um, host utilities. And those are installed in the host directory. So in host user bin, you have some utilities compiled for your host. And inside that this host directory, you have the host user and host tuple of your target sysroot directory, which is the sysroot of your, tar your target system, uh, which is a location which contains all the libraries, headers, and other things needed to build application and libraries for the target. And the reason why this um, uh, set of files is, is inside a directory called host is that host is our SDK. It normally contains all the set of files and programs that are needed to build more applications for a, a system you have generated with build root. And I'll get to, back to that uh, later in the talk as well. Uh, staging is the location where historically all the sysroot things were installed. And so nowadays, it's just basically a simulink to that, that location. Uh, target is the target root file system. So compared to the sysroot, it contains the street binaries, no headers, and you generally no static libraries, and a lot less things. And it also doesn't contain any device files, because again, buildwood doesn't uh, run as root, so it doesn't create the device files. And finally, the images directory, which I already presented before, contains the final images, which are usually the, the end results you're interested in. And two examples of, of system I, I've, um, for which I've generated uh, buildwood, so I will be very relatively vague on the, uh, on the, the final um, uh, well, application of the, of the systems. But one of them is the AT91 based platform with several devices like GPS, RFID readers, GSM modem, Ethernet, USB, and kind of stuff. And the goal was to make an acute based application um, which um, uh, well, receives data from uh, RFID readers and then talks through GSM with a central server, receives data from Ethernet, and so on, and do some, some logic here. So what do we have for the build configuration? We use a code sorcery ARM Gilipsy toolchain, so we can use Gilipsy. Uh, the Linux kernel, we have BuzzyBox, Dropbear, we have Qt, but not the GUI, just the Qt core, Qt network, Qt XML. We have an external library for uh, serial port communication, then a set of other uh, libraries or programs like PPPD or a special RFID library and things like that. The final Qt, Qt application on the top, a GFFS2 root file system, and all that stuff is built with build root in a single configuration. And the file system size is 11 megabytes. So it's relatively reasonable, uh, considering that it contains a part of Qt and the Glibc. So it's pretty small. And the build time of all this from scratch, so you really have nothing before, except the download, uh, the tarballs pre-downloaded. So it's excluding the download time. But for the build time, complete build time from scratch is 10 minutes or on, of course, a relatively fast build server. So on, on that kind of laptop, it's going to be a, a little longer. But that's about the, the build time you can, you can expect. 
Uh, second example, x86 based system, this time with an OpenGL application for vehicle navigation system. I wasn't allowed to give uh, more details on, on that, uh, that system, but basically a, a nice and shiny OpenGL application. Uh, it uses an external glibc toolchain generated with cross tool ng. So I generated a toolchain once for all with cross tool ng. And in build boot, I just say, okay, please use that toolchain in this directory. Uh, it builds the grab bootloader, a Linux kernel image, it contains BuzzyBox, it contains a pretty large part of the x.org stack. So everything that's needed at least to get x, the x server running and an OpenGL application running. It has the um, uh, ATI proprietary driver um, for um, supporting the OpenGL acceleration and a couple of other libraries like video for Linux, Alza and stuff like that, the Lua interpreter, dropper for SSH and things like this, and the OpenGL application itself. Uh, the final file system size is pretty big. I was a bit surprised, 94 megabytes, but it contains 10 megabytes of application, binary and data, and 45 megabytes just for the crappy ATI proprietary driver, which is an, a nightmare. And this whole thing takes 27 minutes to build on the same uh, server I was talking before, and again, it's excluding download time. But uh, since there is a, a cache for uh, the downloaded tarballs, usually you don't have to pay the price of uh, downloading tarballs at every build. Okay, so now to the uh, the best practices. So we'll be uh, putting the light on, on various aspects of uh, the system configuration and and share my my thoughts and what I think are, are the best uh, way the, the best way of, of using build root. So for toolchain building, as I said, you have three choices. You can tell build root, please build a toolchain for me that's limited to uselipsy, and if you do a make clean, which cleans up everything, and do a make again, then build root will restart again and build your toolchain from scratch. That's one solution. Another solution is um, to use cross tool ng as a backend. In that case, uh, build root will also build the toolchain for you, but will basically um, use cross tool ng to do the job, which is quite nice because it offers uh, an additional additional set of options like glibc, eglibc, uselibc. Uh, more GCC versions supported, like GCC versions from Linaro or things like that are supported. But still, we have this problem that if you do make clean, the toolchain gets removed, and next time you do uh, a new build, a new complete build, you have to build the toolchain first. So the mechanism that I use in, in general is uh, the external toolchain mechanism in build root. So the idea is that the toolchain in general really need to be really need to be changed, or at least not as often as you make changes to your root file system and your applications, or it's not the same set of people that do, that do the work. So in general, what I do is that I build once for all a tool chain with cross tool ng, or I use pre-built tool chains from code sorcery, and I just point build roots to that existing tool chain. And in that case, when you start the build, it just takes a couple of seconds to build root to just import uh, the libraries and headers and things from the, from the existing tool chain into its, its staging directory and, and sys root and uh, do all those directories I, I've shown before, and then build root can start the build. And that's the reason why in just two minutes you can have a BuzzyBox uh, system ready, because, well, it just, you run make, it just extract BuzzyBox, runs the configuration, install, in, compile it, install it, generate the final file system image, and you have it. And that's, that's all build root, build root does. So really for a tool chain, that's, that's my recommendation. So we have, um, a uh, set of um, uh, presets for well-known tool chains like the the Kutz well-known there are no uh, nowadays known as sorcery code bench uh, since um, mentor has bought uh, code sorcery so build already knows those tool chain it knows their download locations their configurations so again i can just say okay i do arm system i want to use code bench um 21103 and build will just download it and, and configure itself uh, automatically but it's also possible to specify some custom tool chains. So if you have built your own, uh, you just say, OK, I have a custom tool chain here. Uh, here is its location, its prefix. Here is the C library it uses. You have to also instruct uh, build root about a few information on, on the tool chain, whether it supports like IPv6, RPC, uh, locals, and so on, because build root then makes sure that you, you don't select packages that, that, for example, don't work if IPv6 is not enabled or things like that. And that's about all you have to do to use an existing tool chain. Maybe just a, uh, it's worth mentioning that the tool chain you can use um, here is only a pure tool chain, which means the tool chain that only has a C library in it. 
uh, if you, for example, look at the preliminary um, Linaro um, pre-built uh, tool chains, uh, they are not pure tool chains. They contain several libraries, a Python interpreter, a Perl interpreter, built into it. And due to that, Beirut cannot use those tool chains because they are not pure. Beirut really accept the tool chain that has a compiler, a linker, the traditional bin utils, an NSC library, and potentially a debugger, but that, that's all. Um, so use a pre-built tool chain or build your own. Uh, if you build your own, you can, for example, store it in some HTTP server in your company and make sure that your build, the build root configuration for your device downloads that tool chain so that all of your colleagues or your other teams can, can directly use a, a build root configuration that makes use of that tool chain. And then you can point your build root configuration to it either as a custom tool chain or you can add a new profile for it if, if you want. So this way, it really makes things uh, easy for um, your users uh, to use your, your new tool chain. So that's the, about the tool chain. Uh, about project specific files. So usually when you build a system for a particular device, uh, you have several aspects that will be specific to that hardware and that the application that you put on, on top of it. So things like configuration files, like kernel configuration files, or busy box configuration files, or many other things. Uh, you probably have some additional files to put in the root file system, so not applications, not libraries, but maybe configuration files uh, for network servers or whatever. You may have initialization scripts or anything. Um, you also probably have some specific kernel patches or bootloader patches or things like that. So many uh, files that are uh, relatively specific to your project. And in that case, uh, in build roots, the uh, right place to put them is uh, in a directory that you can create in the board uh, directory. So I usually do board, my company, and the name of the project. And here I put everything that's uh, specific to my project. And I will go through a list of things that I put in that directory. And the first thing that is generally specific to a project is the changes you make uh, to the kernel and to the bootloader so that it works on your board or fix bugs or improve things. And if you want to provide an easy to build uh, build root environment, uh, the easiest way is to give build root a list of patches to apply to the Linux kernel and to the bootloader. So the typical workflow I use is I maintain um, a, a git tree, for example, for the kernel or for the bootloader in which I commit all the necessary changes. I generate a stack of patches with a git format patch and then import all of them into, uh, into build roots. So usually I do, for example, for the kernel boards, name of my company, project, and then a Linux patches directory. I put all my Linux kernel patches in there. And then I configure build roots, so the part of build root that uh, builds the Linux kernel image. And it has an option called a BR2 Linux kernel patch. And I say, OK. This directory contains a set of patches. Um, please apply them uh, before building the kernel. And that way, the people that use the build root configuration without knowing all that details can just do make, and it will do the right thing. Uh, so that it's, it's really something that, at least in the, in the cases I've, I've used build roots, uh, which were important, uh, making the environment easy to use for others, even for non-embedded Linux uh, experts. Uh, so I really wanted it to be transparent. So that's the reason why I have a git, a git tree and I generate patches which I import. So it's kind of a two-step process when I, I do some kernel modifications, but that keeps the, the build root uh, setup pretty simple. So the drawback is that uh, build root does not directly use your kernel git tree, um, but we have improved that recently and I will cover it in the, uh, in the final section of that talk. Uh, so typically the organization I have is uh, uh, shown here. In the board company project, I have the Linux uh, kernel configuration file, the patches, U-boot patches. So yes, the U-boot version is, is like prehistoric, but that's how it was in that project. Uh, some other bootloader patches. I just store uh, the patches in these various directories. And then I have in my dot config. So of course, that's not handwritten. It's all generated by the uh, menu config or whatever config interface you prefer. And I just say, OK, I want U-Boots, I want NT1891 Bootstrap, I want the kernel in this and this and that version, and I want you to apply the patches in that directory, that directory, and that directory. And this way, it really makes the build very easy. And I, I'm, in the end, I get uh, U-Boots and 1891 Bootstrap and kernel image that just work on my device. Um, another aspect is uh, customizing the root file system. 
So obviously, um, you want all the libraries and applications you have selected in the configuration to be part of the root file system, but in general, you have some fine tuning to do here and there to add additional, um, as I say, configuration file or init scripts or things like that. So to understand how it all works, um, here is basically the process that it uses to create the root file system, which we have mostly outlined already. So it copies a skeleton. Um, the default one is in FS skeleton, but you can um, tell Goodwood to use a different one if you want. So it really contains basically the, the top level directories of a normal Linux file system and some files here and there. Then it copies the base libraries from, from the tool chain, like C library and, and related libraries. Then installs all the packages. So when we talk about packages in Buildwood, we don't talk about packages like binary packages like you have in Ubuntu or Debian or things like that. Our packages are just like recipes to build and install a given library or a given application. So it goes through the make install basically of all the, um, the, the, the uh, software and user space elements you have selected. It executes a configuration specified post-build script and then generates the file system images in the selected formats, GFFS2 and, and, and UBIFS and others. So depending on which modification you want to make the, 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 to the root file system, um, you might need to do different things. And it's, in general, not a single solution, but a combination of, of uh, several solutions that uh, is uh, the, right, uh, the right way to, to do the, the, the customization. So you can provide a different file system skeleton if the default one is not really appropriate. Uh, but if you only need to make tiny modification to the skeleton, in general, I would prefer to do it in a post-build script, which I will present uh, just after. The reason is, uh, if you keep using the default skeleton, then if you upgrade build root to a newer version, then you will, you will benefit from the, the, the modifications. But you have the possibility of specifying your own custom skeleton, and that's perfectly fine as well. You can also create packages that install application files, uh, whatever you want, into the um, um, the, the root file system, the skeleton is really only here for basic configuration files. I have seen some people using the skeleton to put their, their application binaries and stuff like that. It's not really designed for that. Uh, if you have some uh, like very uh, specified and isolated elements to install, install in your root file system, creating packages is, is very easy. Even if there is nothing to build, actually, it's just copying files over, uh, creating packages is, is uh, very easy and, and probably the, the right way of doing things. And finally, it's possible to tell Build Root, okay, please call this shell script or whatever type of um, scripting language you prefer um, uh, before um, uh, creating the file system images. So it's really, um, as I lighted on the previous slide, executed after the installation of everything and just before Build Root creates the file system image. So you can do in this script whatever tuning you want, like removing some files that are useless, uh, patching some uh, existing files, whatever you want. So it's really uh, a nice way of doing some uh, post-build post uh, customization. So what I typically do is, again, in this Borg company project directory, create a postbuild.sh script and tell BuildRoot to run it with some br 2 rootfs post build script um, <coughs> configuration item. And it gets executed. And its um, sole uh, argument is the location of the target file system. Uh, so it, that script knows where to do the modifications. So typically, I do things like tuning the init tab, the FS tab, or secure TTY files. I also usually create a root FS addition subdirectory, uh, which, in which I put some other configuration files and stuff, and I just take everything in that directory and put it inside my target root file system, so I can have like, you know, the OpenSSH configuration file or uh, whatever uh, other things that are necessary. And that's typically something just like that, so I get the target directory as a first argument. I might customize the, the root password. I might add some entry in the FS tab or create some directory in the target file system, copy the uh, root FS additions I was mentioning. But it's really only limited by what your imagination can do. Um, since we're talking about root file system and generation and customization, I'm taking that opportunity to talk a little bit about how uh, BuildRoot manages the slash data directory. And it basically proposes uh, four um, different mechanisms. Uh, static, dev TMPFS, dev TMPFS plus MDEV, dev TMPFS plus UDEV. So you really have um, a variety of solutions. Uh, it's true that our preference uh, these days goes towards dev TMPFS 
because it really makes things easier. But if you really want to have uh, static uh, device files, it's also possible. When you use static device files, basically, uh, we look as a device table with a set of device files and their uh, corresponding major and minors. And it uh, creates them before uh, building the final file system images using fake root to avoid uh, being root at any moment in the build. Um, However, whichever solution is chosen, there is still device table that is used, not to create device files, but to, but to put uh, specific permissions or ownership properties on certain files or directories. So we still call that a device table, which is quite unfortunate, but that's, that's the current terminology. And you can also uh, um, add additional device table, like if you have a specific file that needs to be installed with suite root or with specific ownership and so on, it's also possible to do it. Um, project specific packages, so if you want to add um, some additional components in VL root that are specific to your project, here is my recommended way of doing things. Um, uh, as creating packages is really easy, well, feel, really feel free to, to explore that, that uh, possibility. So what I usually do is in the package directory, I create a subdirectory named after the company or named after the project or whatever, but some, some place isolated from, from everything else. I create some make file in it, which just includes all the make files of the subdirectories. That's the technique we use in build root, so that the top level make files is, is aware of all the packages that um, are present in, in the build root tree. Um, of course, that's only if the, pack, the package you're creating is not a package for an existing open source component. If it's an existing open source component publicly available, it's much better to package it normally and submit the patch to the build root community so you don't have to maintain it forever. And then for each package, you create a directory for your package, a make file that describes the recipe to build it, but we have a special language to, to kind of special make sub-language to write the, the recipe, so it's much, much simpler than writing a complete a make file. You write a config.in configuration file that gives the configuration options for your, your package. So at least one config option is mandatory to enable, disable your package, but you can add uh, dozens more if you want to fine tune the config of your package. And then from package slash config.in, you just source your new uh, config.in file so that your new package shows up in the menu config interface. And then to write the recipe, we have three infrastructures in build root to make um, the writing of um, package recipes relatively easy. The auto targets, CMake targets, and gen targets infrastructure respectively for AutoTools-based packages, CMake-based packages, and everything else-based packages. Uh, so for AutoTools-based packages, for example, you just need to say, okay, here the package tarball is at this, this location on the internet, this version, and I want to pass dash dash enable foobar. And you just then say to BuildRoot, this is an AutoTools-based package, and BuildRoot does, does the rest. So it will know how to configure it, how to pass the right arguments to con the configure script, do all the leap tool uh, munging that is needed, uh, all nasty things are handled by, by Beirut automatically. Same thing for CMake targets. For gen targets, it's a generic infrastructure, so Beirut doesn't know anything about the build system of your components, so it's up to you to say, okay, to configure my component, I need to run that specific set of commands to build it, I need to run that specific set of commands to install it, etc., etc. So here the documentation is, um, is very detailed on this, this aspect, so don't hesitate to have a look if you want to have uh, more details. Um, typically, the package source code uh, can be downloaded as a tarball from HTTP, FTP, but also can be fetched from a Git, Merkle, or Subversion repository as well. Um, but for uh, project-specific application or libraries, can be useful to store them locally, so that instead of fetching them um, every time you need to test a new version, uh, you have the source code just around and, and uh, in a different version control strategy. So for small utilities, sometimes what I do is just put the source code inside the package directory itself when it's just a very basic library or application of one of two source files that can be enough. But it's, well, it kind of mixes your build system with some software components. That's not really nice, but for basic things, it, it, it works. And for larger programs or libraries uh, for which you have uh, their own version control mechanism, um, you can override the package extraction commands so that it, uh, instead of having build root extract a tarball or download it from the internet, it just copies um, your source code from a given directory into its build directory before uh, running the normal process. And here is an example for a CMake application. So my CMake application has a few dependencies, a version, 
I just override the, uh, the default extract commands, and what I do is that I go to the top directory, which is the main um, um, build root source directory. I go up one directory and go into my company application um, directory and copy everything that's inside into the build directory, which is that this at the uh, make thing. And then build root does the configuration and compilation. That's a CMake based package, so I have nothing to say uh, to, 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 um, to make it happen here. And I also override the um, target installation commands. Here it was just the case in that, uh, in that example. And for the installation, I just copy the application binary to the, um, uh, the final, uh, in that case, not the file system directly, but to the image directory. And I call the uh, CMake targets infrastructure. So it's very easy to um, like tune a little bit um, how the, the build root logic to fetch packages so that instead of fetching from HTTP or for, from a, a remote Git repo, it takes locally. So you can more easily um, modify your application, recompile it, and, and um, well, make the, the uh, modi modify, compile, run, debug uh, cycle uh, quicker. So during uh, application development, uh, BuildRoot is mainly an integration utility. So once a package has been built, it is not rebuilt. So BuildRoot basically keeps stem files to know which package has been built and if that stem file is still around and um, its state is correct um, co relatively to other stem files, then the package is not rebuilt. Uh, so when you work on the development of a component like an application or a library, and you work actively on it, like you make modification, you fix bugs, you make uh, improvements. Uh, usually, I think it's more convenient to build it outside of BuildRoot. Really, have to see BuildRoot as something that takes all your software components to produce your final file system image. But during the development of your custom software components, it's still uh, much easier, at least in my opinion, to do it outside of BuildRoot. So, whatever build system you use, uh, AutoTools, CMake, or custom make file, or whatever, just use the build root infrastructure and I will give some uh, some details on that and do your compile test debug cycle as if build root wasn't here. Uh, we have some new features that should make that a little bit easier in the future but that's still an ongoing uh, effort. So basically in the host directory we have all of uh, our SDK so the cross compiler is there, all the libraries for the target, all the headers for the target, the pkg config files, and all kind of uh, things like that are inside this host directory. So you have the, uh, the cross compiler, typically uh, ARM Linux something or PowerPC Linux something or MIPS Linux something. And these uh, binaries are wrappers that make sure that uh, the appropriate sysroot option is passed to your compiler. So if you don't know uh, what sysroot is, it basically it makes things magic and make sure that your compiler will find the libraries and headers that BuildRoot has built and installed into the sysroot without uh, you having to specify some terrible um, command line options. Um, it also contains some other useful utilities like PKG config or QMake if you have used Qt. Well, all the host utilities that can be useful in the cross compilation process of other components are inside this uh, host directory. Uh, for example, for CMake uh, based um, Packages, it also generates a uh, um, tool chain description file that's a CMake concept, which is, uh, I, I think, quite nice. Uh, you can just say, tell CMake, okay, I want to build this component using the tool chain described in this file. And this configuration file is automatically generated by build roots. So building an external CMake based application or library on top of a build root system is really, really easy. So here are some examples for a, a single file application which I build manually with GCC and use PKG config to ask for the right uh, library flags and C flags to use uh, glib 2.0. Uh, so just a relatively simple line. For uh, AutoTools component, it's also relatively uh, easy as well. Just export where are the cross compiler. There might be some additional flags to pass as well, but that's the, base, uh, the baseline. And for CMake, we have this uh, toolchain file description, and that makes it very easy to, uh, to use CMake uh, application as well. So that allows you, during development of your libraries or application, to build them externally. And only when you are reaching like the end of the development, you can, um, um, well, put them inside build root as packages. It's still possible to force build root to rebuild the package, and I use that quite often. Um, 
because, um, well, when you do work on build root, you don't want to clean everything up to, to make a new try. Um, so what you can do is know a little bit how build root works internally. And the way it works is by storing stem files. So those are empty files. And they are hidden uh, because they start with a dot. And they mark that each step of the package build process has been done or not done. So there's a stem, uh, stem file for the extract step, for the configure step, for the build step, etc., etc. And by just removing one of those stem files and running make again, you will f basically force build root to rerun that step, step again. So if you want to rebuild the package, you remove the dot stem builds file, do make again, and build root will just rebuild that specific package. Um, it's also possible to force the complete rebuild of a package, just remove its output builds my package name dash version remove its complete source code. So all, since the stem files are stored inside this directory, it will basically tell build root, okay, do everything again on this package. Re-extract it, re-patch it, reconfigure it, rebuild it, reinstall it. So you can this way, instead of having to rebuild everything, you just rebuild one, one package. But again, there will be improvements on, on this in the upcoming build root version. And I hope to have uh, five minutes again to, uh, to talk about those. Um, during application development, using NFS is very practical. A lot of uh, newcomers to build root uh, do a mistake and try to use the output target directory uh, as the, the directory to mount um, for, as the root file system on their device. But as I said in the beginning of the talk, the, the output target directory is not the complete root file system, and especially it doesn't contain the device files, and it may not contain the appropriate permissions for all the files. And those elements are really only uh, available in the final file system images that BuildRoot use, um, produces using fake root. And the reason, again, is because BuildRoot does not run anything as root. So the right way to use NFS with BuildRoot is to ask BuildRoot to generate a tarball image of the root file system. Well, it could be any other format, but tarball is the most convenient one. And then you uncompress this tarball image as root in whatever directory you want exported by NFS. So basically, the only thing that runs as root is the extraction, which is a lot more reasonable than running the whole uh, build roots uh, build process as root. And um, and then you're you're good to boot your your board. So typically, um, you can use some command line that, like the one shown here, uh, make and uh, the thing. Well, a sudo prefix would have been better, obviously. And it will uncompress your root file system in NFS root, and you can use it. So that's just to let you know about this typical mistake. Um, so once you have your uh, customization on the root file system, your kernel patches, you have set up all your configuration items properly, your system builds fine, of course you want to save your configuration into uh, some safe place uh, so that other people can, can use it directly. So here we just work exactly like the kernel. You do make safe def config. It will generate you a def config file in the top build root source directory. You put it into the configs directory with uh, underscore def config prefix. And then it automati automatically becomes a new make target. So you can run make blah, 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 def config. And it will load your configuration. And you can run make and do your build. So typically for uh, the build root system that I do for customers, I uh, do such a configuration and then just tell them run make foobar dev config make and it just runs for uh, some minutes depending on how many packages you've selected and they have their system uh, ready and I know that the builds will be exactly the same as the one I've done on my machine. Um, so your uh, project specific bits basically will be in board company project, the config file, and potentially the package, the packages you will have added into the package company directory. So they are relatively isolated from the build root core. So if you have to upgrade to a newer build root version um, for what re whatever reason, uh, it, it's relatively uh, easy to do. Um, there are also some features that are useful when using uh, build root for um, real projects. And one of, one of those features is the, the features to um, be prepared for offline builds. So BuildRoot automatically downloads the source code from, um, from the internet. But in general, you want to be autonomous in, uh, in how to, you build your, your system. And to do that, you have to make sure that all the tarballs, all the Git repositories, all the Merkle repositories that you rely on will be available forever. 
And the best way to do that is to make a local copy. And build root has some useful features to do so. Make source will download all the tarballs that you want into its cache so that you are sure that your cache contains everything that's, that's needed. Make external depths will list the file names of all the tarballs that are in your cache and that are needed to build your system offline. Um, there is a way of, of overriding the location where buildwood downloads files. So normally it just goes to the official website of the component and then falls back to a, a mirror that the buildwood developers maintain. But if you want, you can say, okay, I want you to go first on this HTTP server, which is internal to my com company. So that's if that HTTP server has all the necessary tables, you can uh, be sure to be able to reproduce the system exactly as it was, even in five years from now or maybe 10 years from now. It's also possible to tune the location of the local download cache uh, with either a config option or an environment variable. So it's very flexible here, and you can relatively easily design a way uh, of um, making things uh, work uh, for you. So just a few um, new features in uh, PL Root uh, 2011, uh, which should show up next month again. Um, it will natively support packages whose source code is in a local directory. So instead of doing the uh, extract uh, command overriding, uh, which I showed before, you can just say, okay, the site of my package, instead of being some HTTP server, is a local directory. And there is a new site method. So the site method is how the package is fetched. So we have like HTTP, we have um, a Git, we have Mercurial, we have Subversion and so on. And the new one is local. And it will just understand that the site is a local directory. We will copy everything into the build directory and then do the build. Um, so it's relatively uh, easy uh, to use. Um, so that works fine for your own packages. But let's say you have um, a package that already exists in build root and you want to leverage its build root recipe, but you don't want to use the official version, but some version you have locally. Typically for the Linux kernel, you generally don't want to use exactly the vanilla version. Uh, except if you're perfect and all your board support is, is mainline, but I guess it's not the case for uh, most of the people. So you want to use that, that kernel that is uh, available locally in your machine. And what you can do is with the new buildwood version is override the source directories on a per package basis. So how you do that is you write a short make file, which is just, in fact, uh, variable assignments. You say, okay, for the Linux package, so Linux override source dir, here is the source directory. And in that case, uh, build root, instead of downloading the tarball from HTTP or from Git or whatever uh, method you specify, will directly take the source codes from that directory or sync it into the build directory and, and run the build from here. So it, we hope it will, it, um, it will make the, uh, uh, the using build root during, during development a little bit easier. But that's really a new set of features, and we're really open to feedbacks on, on whether they are good, um, whether they, they, they match the, the, the requirements of, of users or not. So it's really new things. We'll see in the future whether it, it really works out or not. Uh, some other features that will show up is um, uh, make pkg-reconfigure and make pkg-rebuild. So it's available for all packages, like the Linux package or the GTK package or whatever. And instead of manually man manipulating the stem files, those, will, those comments will um, simply restart the, pro the build process of a package from the configure step or the build step. So if you do a make GTK reconfigure, it will rerun the configure script, the build uh, procedure, and uh, the installation procedure uh, for that GTK package only. Uh, we will also have package, uh, support for fetching from Mercurial repositories and support for fetching using SCP, uh, both for packages and for the primary download site. So this is also a, a feature useful in um, inside companies uh, when you have a different way of, of sharing packages, uh, source codes, uh, than HTTP or FTP. So I think um, BuildRoot has uh, multiple features um, make, that make it relatively easy to customize the generated system. Uh, maybe the documentation wasn't really ob obvious about all those possibilities at the moment, and I hope that this uh, talk has uh, kind of uh, filled the gap here. Um, I think it makes build root stable to generate embedded link systems for a, a wide range of, of projects, but um, uh, I, I think uh, with a preference on, on moderately uh, sized systems, so systems with a, 
limited set of packages on bigger systems, real uh, distributions will probably be, be better. And uh, the good thing is that with all those um, possibilities, build root remains simple enough to be understood uh, by non-Linux experts. Um, and that's a really good thing about this build system in my, my opinion. So I think we have a couple of minutes left for uh, questions. Yes? Okay, so let me repeat what uh, Jan said. There will be a Buildwood developer meeting and cross Solengi developer meeting uh, this Saturday, probably here at the hotel and so, or some other place in Prague. Or, so see if some people are interested in discussing this further, we'll have a full day for, uh, for discussion. But of course, if there are other questions, yes? So the question is, what are the major uh, advantages or disadvantages compared to uh, Open Embedded and Yocto? So which, which basically is the, um, I would say, traditional question about build root. Um, advantages, um, I would say, simple to get, to use to, simple to modify, um, simple to change, so simplicity. And maybe build time. Um, at least from my experience, the build time with OE is even for relatively small systems with just uh, three, four packages is relatively long. Um, so that's probably on the advantage side. On the drawback side, uh, Buildwood does not gen is not a distribution generator. So OE or Nyocto build you a set of packages in the, r the real sense of the term, binary packages, and the system that is generated, you can install and remove and upgrade packages uh, exactly like a normal distribution. And Buildwood does not do anything like that. It really generates a final target file system image. And if you want to do modifications to it, you have to go back to Buildwood, add some more packages, remove some others, and so on. And also, Buildwood does not track, in track installed files. So if you remove a package from the configuration and you run make, it doesn't get removed from your root file system. You have to rebuild everything from scratch. So that's kind of a drawback that keeps the build system very simple, so it makes it, in my opinion, usable for moderately sized systems, uh, but for bigger systems, definitely, I wouldn't recommend build root. So it, it really depends on what you're doing. If you're doing a multimedia full feature system with hundreds of packages, uh, you want to allow the, the, the user to be able to upgrade some parts of the system, like add new applications, things like that, without upgrading the whole system, definitely build root is not the right tool for the job, and OE and Yocto are probably. If you're doing an industrial system with 10, 20 packages, uh, you want some simple tool and that uh, non-embedded Linux experts can use, I think build root is the right tool for the job, but maybe OE people and Yocto people would disagree. So I think we are, we, we're not targeting exactly the same type of system, even if they, there is, of course, some overlap between the, the two solutions. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it has a K-config interface as well, and a normal make language, so it's, it, that's all part of the simplicity thing, in my opinion. So if you're a kernel developer or a um, like normal embedded Linux developer, it's really easy because that's tools you know already. What about Linaro support yeah. in terms of? Uh, okay, that will be the last question because I'm asked to, to stop. Um, so the, the Linaro support, uh, basically, uh, for, for the, from the perspective of the build system, uh, Linaro mainly produces um, a compiler and a special version of, uh, of GDB. And um, uh, build root itself doesn't have support for the GCC uh, versions of Linaro and GDB version of Linaro, but through the, the cross-tool ng backend, um, it's, uh, that supports the those version, it's possible to generate a toolchain that uses a Linaro uh, GCC and a Linaro GDB. So there are some relation in the way that yes, we can use a Linaro GCC and a Linaro GDB, and we can use whatever toolchain you want. The only thing that doesn't work yet with Linaro is usage of their pre-built binary toolchains. But if you generate the toolchain yourself using cross tool ng, uh, you can get a, GC, a Linaro based GCC and then generate your system with build root without any problem. 
Okay, I've exhausted my time. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Have a nice uh, conference and maybe see you in the hallway. Thank you again. Thank you.